Globalization includes the interactions and interdependence of people around the world. While the level and ease of global interactions we know today is a fairly new phenomenon in human history, that doesn't mean we didn't have international trade before now. The Silk Road is probably the best known example of an international trade route that existed for thousands of years and went from China to Europe through various routes across Asia and Europe, traveling through the mountains, marshes, desert, almost a quarter of the distance around the globe. You had to be quite brave to travel any part of this route because you had to be prepared for bandits robbing you or harsh weather threatening to kill you. But the money was worth it to these traders. You've ever heard of Marco, Marco Polo? He's an explorer that reputedly traveled this route that brought spices and silk from China through the Middle East to Europe. Along the way, information was also shared between a variety of cultures, which provided us with many important inventions like paper and the Muslim ideas of mathematics, language and scientific discoveries that are still used today. Over time, European monarchies wanted to find a new way to access those goods in the East without having to pay all of the tolls they had to throughout the Silk Road. So they funded explorers to find a new ocean route, thus guys like Columbus. His exploration of the New World changed our world forever. Notice I said exploration, not discovery. Obviously, the people already living in the Americas knew it was there. Explorers important to Canada include Champlain, who established many of the early settlements that still exist today, like Quebec City, and Cartier, who initially mapped and claimed the St. Lawrence region for France, even coined the term Canada for the region. While explorers like Columbus have been praised for generations, that's changing in your lifetime as we start to recognize the different perspectives of what that exploration did to change the lives of people, for both good and bad, which is the focus of this unit. When these explorers surveyed land new to Europeans, they would claim that land for their sponsors, the monarchs of Europe. We call this imperialism, one country's domination over another country's economic, political, and cultural institutions. All of this had very strong connections to global trade. When Columbus and other explorers brought goods from these new lands to Europe, like cocoa and corn and potatoes and vanilla, Europeans were willing to pay top dollar for those goods. And goods from Europe were also adopted by the locals in the Americas. We call this the Columbian Exchange, and this global international trade changed the world forever. A simple example of this is the fact that most of the oranges we get are from the southern US, but they originated in southern China. Even more important is how globalization impacted the cultures when the two different groups interacted. If you could say that the Silk Road was globalization version 1.0, the Columbian Exchange would be globalization 2.0, and the Industrial Revolution took globalization to a whole new level. Early or old imperialism, mostly during the 15th century, was focused on gold, God, and glory. Leaders supported the exploration and takeover of new territories in order to find valuable resources like gold, which helped to strengthen the monarchy because now they had more money to fight wars and gain more territory, which brought them more glory. And religious leaders, who were much more powerful at this time, would support imperialism because then they could go and convert all the heathen people around the world to Christianity. But this all changed due to the Industrial Revolution, transforming the focus to be linked more to capitalism and economic trade. So what was the Industrial Revolution? We call it a revolution because it entirely changed the way people lived, both positively with the access to more and cheaper goods, and negatively due to the exploitation of workers and the environment. The Industrial Revolution was also a shift from the economy being controlled by the elite to regular people having a chance to participate and get rich. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, monarchs controlled the economy through a system we call mercantilism. This system grew out of the Dark Ages when there was a lot of chaos in Europe. During the Renaissance, city-states and their bankers became very powerful. It was the rich nobles who were controlling it all, and it was taken for granted that the nobility could control the economy. Remember, they're the ones financing all that exploration. So the nobility, usually the king, would grant charters to companies like the Hudson's Bay Company or the East India Company, who would then get a monopoly to do business in the region, with the agreement that part of the focus of that business would be to help make sure that the monarchy had enough wealth, especially gold and silver, to keep them powerful. This all meant that these companies then became colonial governments in the region. Philosophers like Adam Smith questioned this system, saying we shouldn't have to ask the king permission to start a business, and the wealth of the whole country, not just the nobility, is what's really important. His ideas are known as capitalism. Do you remember those ideas from Social Nine? As these ideas spread and were supported by governments in countries like Great Britain, businesses needed to find more resources to make their products and more markets to buy their products. The Industrial Revolution really started with the textile industries in England. The demand for English cloth was high, in part, due to the colonies Britain was controlling. 
Now what had been traditionally made in homes and small-scale enterprises was being done in large factories through inventions like the spinning jenny. And to get more resources in new markets meant using the new technology like the steam engine to move goods and people. Imperialist expansion was a natural result of nations wanting to have the best opportunities for their people. Many European countries established colonies around the world that would provide them with raw materials and, of course, the colonists would buy products from the mother country. And with greater resources, you then get greater military power and influence around the world. There's different types of colonies. Some of them are directly controlled by the mother country. So people from Britain and France came to Canada and ruled over. There's also colonies with indirect rule, where local people still get to be the rulers, but they have to do what the mother country tells them to do. There's also protectorates or spheres of influence, where a more powerful country will promise to protect and trade with another country, but the other country usually has to do what the more powerful country tells them to. Canada was part of both the British and French empires. The British Empire was physically the largest empire in world history, with over a quarter of the world being controlled by Britain. A famous saying was, the sun never sets on the British Empire, because it was so big. While the region of Canada was initially explored for gold, God, and glory, the Industrial Revolution increased European settlement in Canada, as more individuals wanted to get into the lucrative fur trade. Those hats sure were popular. And to establish other businesses as more and more people came to settle. This led to the creation of what I consider to be one of the best countries in the world, and the UN agrees with me, often ranking Canada among the top 10 countries in the world to live in. Without imperialist globalization, Canada wouldn't exist. Britain also colonized regions like India, bringing them technology like railways and improved medicine. They organized their education system. By tying the British and Indian economies together, many Indian entrepreneurs now had opportunities to make it rich. And with better transportation technology, that led to the rapid growth of global markets, the globalization we know today. Of course, there's the negative consequences, but that's for the next video.